All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our second installment of Friends of the North Fork Spring Lecture Series, 250 Years on the North Fork, Looking Back and Looking Ahead. This year, we were really inspired by Shenandoah County's 250th anniversary, and so we put a series together where we're going to be examining the history of human interaction with the North Fork, the ecological impacts associated, and how we can move forward to protect the river we all love. My name is Julia Sargent, and I am the Director of Programs with Friends of the North Fork. Founded in 1988, our organization is a nonprofit based in the heart of the Shenandoah Valley, working to help keep the North Fork clean, healthy, and beautiful through advocacy, community action, education, and science. So if you aren't a member, we encourage you to see what we're all about and join us by visiting www.fnfsr.org. Corey, if you want to go to the next slide, um, while you are looking at your schedules for the next couple weeks, definitely mark your calendars for our upcoming lectures in this series, where we're going to be hearing from Shenandoah County planners past and present, and learning about the iron furnaces of Shenandoah County. Um, all of our lectures will be available on YouTube for viewing. So if you missed Kristen Lee's lecture last time, feel free to check it out there. So today we are going to be hearing from Corey Gilliams, a lead conservationist with USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, working with the Smith Creek Partnership. He's going to discuss how this 105 square mile watershed listed as impaired for nutrient and sediment pollution in 1996 is becoming part of the solution and a model for remediation of non-point source pollution. Corey has worked with the NRCS helping farmers and landowners plan and implement conservation practices on their land for almost 21 years, with a little over 17 years of that time here in the Shenandoah Valley. Corey has been directly involved with the Smith Creek Partnership since its inception in 2010. Thank you so much, Corey, for taking the time to talk with us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, hey, thanks for having me this evening, Julia. I'm really excited about talking about Smith Creek. So um, as Julia said, I'm Corey Williams and, and uh, I'm in, and the district conservationist within RCS out of our Harrisonburg field office. Now I'll tell you, Smith Creek, uh, that watershed covers two counties. Or, uh, Rock, most of it's in Rockingham County and a portion is in uh, Shandoah County. And uh, my counterpart, Brent Barito, um, the district conservationist in our Strasburg office uh, covers the Shandoah County portion. So I'm going to mainly be speaking about the activities in the Rockingham County portion of the watershed, but there, there will be a little bit of overlap in the Shenandoah County. Um, so, um, and, and this, 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 this presentation is very high level. I feel like most of the things I, I can uh, will mention tonight will be, it could, could actually be their own independent, you know, 45 to an hour. 45 minute to an hour talk in and of themselves. So just gonna give you kind of a quick overview of what, a little bit about the watershed and what we've done with this project um, over the past 12 years. Um, so basically just a little bit of background on the Smith Creek watershed. Um, it's roughly uh, 67,000 acres, um, about 105 square miles. Um, there's 286, almost 287 miles of streams. Um, that's large streams and small streams combined uh, in the watershed. Um, if you were to, to, to get out and measure driving, it's about 25 miles from the southern part of the watershed uh, to the northern part of the watershed. Um, it's about seven and a little over seven, almost seven and a half miles at its widest point in the southern uh, part of the valley or the, the upstream part of the watershed. And at its narrowest point in uh, kind of the Newmarket area in Shandell County, it's just under three miles wide. Um, within the, the, the 67,000 acre watershed, uh, the, the northern part of the city of Harrisonburg, um, or the upper part of the watershed, um, as well as Rockingham and Shandell counties, um, as well as the town of Newmarket are, are all in the watershed. Um, the, the, the watershed is divided into four what we call sub watersheds. Um, and so in, in just a minute, I'll talk a little bit about each of the sub watersheds, but we have Dry Fork, um, in the upstream part of the watershed, as well as Mountain Run, and then what we call War Branch, and then what we call uh, Gap Creek. And I'll go in a little more detail, like I said, just a minute on each one of those sections. Um, the Smith Creek watershed is, is mostly karst terrain. 
So by karst, I mean that it is underlain by a limestone bedrock, um, of various types of limestone. Um, and with that karst topography comes some of the telltale uh, indicators of that. So there's, there are at least uh, 329 mapped sinkholes um, in the watershed. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more than that. But those are the ones that are just mapped either through uh, USGS and or through the NRCS soil surveys for Rockingham and or Shenandoah counties. Um, there are also at least 35 known caves um, in the watershed and there are many um, large springs in, in the watershed that, that contribute a significant amount of flow to B. Smith Creek um, and its tributaries. Um, and uh, we've got a basic geology map kind of showing uh, the watershed here. Um, if you can see my pointer, um, the, the limestone is kind of the central part, the southern part of the watershed, the up, upstream part. Um, when you get up into the, to, to the northern part of the watershed or the downstream part, you, you kind of get into some more um, what they call Martinsburg formations, which are kind of a, a, a shale, like a silt shale and or a calcareous shale. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the eastern side of the watershed is the, the Massanutten Mountain, so you have some sandstones and, and that sort of thing there. So um, the, the land use of Smith Creek is, is highly agricultural. Um, and uh, I've got some numbers here. Let me look at my notes. Um, there's basically, um, let me do my notes here. Do, do, do. About 43% of the watershed is, is what is considered intensively farmed, and that's either uh, being cropland for row crop production um, or uh, perennial hayland, that's grass and or alfalfa or orchard grass um, and or pasture. Um, the remainder of the watershed is either a national forest uh, on the, the eastern part of the watershed and or private forest. Um, most of the private forest land is land that is too rocky um, to farm and that, that's why it's in, in woodland. Um, there is a little bit of urban areas. Um, you have Interstate 81 going pretty much the, the length of the watershed um, uh, south to north from Harrisonburg all the way up into Newmarket. Uh, when you're driving on 81, you're pretty much in the Smith Creek watershed. So if you're, if you're going north on 81, just visualize in your mind, if you will, once you get past the 247 exit, which is the main Harrisonburg exit, Route, 40, uh, Route 33, a little about less than a mile from that exit, you enter into Smith Creek. So everything to your right will be uh, east. Uh, you see the Massanutten Mountain Range, that's the top of the watershed there. Um, and then if you're going on up interstate, everything to your left, you're going to kind of see a, a, a wooded ridge line pretty much all the way up through the watershed. There's some breaks here and there. Um, that's pretty much the, the, the western boundary of the watershed. Um, but because we have, uh, and the reason why it's so intensively farmed um, is, is, is because we have those good, you know, it is karst, like I was saying, so that usually means limestone soils. So we have really good soils in the watershed. Um, about 33% of the watershed is considered either state and or uh, state uh, important soils and or prime farmland soils. Um, so um, a little bit about kind of the different subunits, um, sub watersheds, uh, I'll kind of start uh, going south and, and moving north, going down the watershed. So Dry Fork, um, it's for, for uh, governmental purposes, we call it Watershed PS59, and that stands for Potomac Shenandoah Basin. Um, that watershed's about 13,985 acres, heavily karsted. Um, dry Fork gets its name honest, um, and uh, because it is dry most of the year. Um, it doesn't always go completely dry. There are pools of water that even during dry times stay the same level. Um, they're in some of those pools individually, they could be connected with water flowing below the surface or they're just, they're, they're impervious and the water can't go anywhere. Um, very, very unique watershed. Um, uh, I've seen it like in this picture here, the water is flowing muddy. This is after a rain event. I'm actually looking upstream. Um, and uh, it's this picture about a little bar out in the creek just behind me and I couldn't find a good photo that wasn't cloudy. There's, there's actually a spring coming into the creek, a groundwater flow and the water's flowing almost greenish blue coming out of it. And so the, the creek's flowing muddy because of a, a storm event, but there's groundwater coming in and it's pretty clean. In this exact same spot, I, I didn't have a camera with me. I wish I did. And this is before we had cell phone cameras in our pocket all the time, but the exact opposite was happening. I had clean water flowing one day and there was muddy water coming out of the ground. Um, so it's just pretty, pretty neat. Uh, the, the 
pretty much the northern part of the city of Harrisonburg drains into this, this dry fork drainage. So there, there is a little bit of urban runoff. Um, it's mainly apartments and some businesses and stuff like that. Um, there are there is a trailer park in the in the uh, very northern part of this or upstream part of this watershed. Um, again, a lot of sinkholes. There's some caves in the watershed. Um, as far as agriculture in the watershed, um, it's predominantly pasture um, because it's so rocky. But there is some cropland, um, and there there are uh, mainly beef cattle operations. And there are some some poultry operations in, in the watershed too. Uh, the Smith Creek Mountain Run Watershed, or PS60, um, 13,689 acres is the drainage area of this watershed. So this watershed is Smith Creek itself, as well as Mountain Run. Um, Mountain Run drains off of the Massanutten uh, through Fridley's Gap. Uh, Fridley, Fridley's Run actually runs into Mountain Run, and then it flows out into the valley uh, and changes geology from sandstone shale into limestone and then flows into Smith Creek, actually just a little bit downstream of where this photo was taken. Um, the Smith Creek stem of this, of, of this part of the watershed actually starts at a large spring uh, on the Yancey farm. Um, it's a, it's a, at peak flow, uh, uh, well over a million gallons a day. At low flow, it's in the, I think, three to 500,000 uh, gallons uh, per day. Uh, flow. This watershed is is good soil, so that there there are is a good bit of cropland, uh, mainly beef cattle, um, and poultry operations that are the livestock operations um, in the area. A, a lot of large uh, springs are in this watershed. Um, I mentioned the Yancey Spring, um, kind of the head of Smith Creek itself. Uh, downstream of that, uh, on the Bruce Brothers property, that's Cavalier Farms and Rainbow Hill Farms. Some of you guys may recognize those names. Um, there's there's a large spring there, and then there's some some other springs downstream of that. Um, so the kind of moving down the watershed, the next segment is Smith Creek and War Branch, um, uh, or PS61. So 14,340 acre watershed. Uh, again, just like the Mountain Run Smith Creek portion of the watershed, there's, there's several large limestone springs um, in this watershed, good stable flow. Um, this watershed starts um, where Dry Fork flows into the main stem of Smith Creek. And just, just a little bit downstream of this, um, that the, the confluence of those two streams, uh, Lacey Springs flows into um, to Smith Creek. And kind of a little bit unique about Lacey Springs, um, the, the USGS, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, hopefully, USGS has done some studies and the water and dry fork that goes underground, they have linked that to coming out at Lacey Springs, um, which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, one thing I'll say too about um, the, the springs in this, this watershed um, is the USGS has done, as, as part of the Smith Creek project, has done an extensive amount of study and found that uh, the, the, a lot of the water is high in nitrate um, and that nitrate has been in the ground for a while. So even if we do conservation practices on the landscape, it may be a, a while, uh, maybe even over a hundred years or more before the, the benefits of those practices can be seen because there's so much legacy nutrients in, in the groundwater. And, and that comes from the karst influence um, with the surface waters going into the groundwater and later coming back up. All right, and uh, so back. So then you got the War Branch. It is, is starts off with the Massanutten, and that flows down and picks up from several large springs, and then flows into uh, Smith Creek, uh, kind of in the Tenth Legion area of Rockingham County. So then the last segment of Smith Creek is what we call Ga the Gap Creek section, PS62. So you have Gap Creek, which is actually flowing, kind of, it's actually flowing south out behind uh, the, the the peak there at Mount Jackson and then flowing into Smith Creek just before Smith Creek flows into um, the North Fork of the Shenandoah there at Mount Jackson. Um, the main stem of Smith Creek um, is, is uh, pretty large at this point because you're, you're dealing with most of the watershed. This, this particular part of the watershed is 25,000 acres, 25,321 acres. Uh, it starts basically where War Branch flows into the main stem of Smith Creek. Um, in this segment of the watershed, um, there are a lot of row crops. The land's a little flatter in places. Um, there are some poultry operations, a lot of beef cattle. Um, I believe there's one dairy in this part of the, this part of the watershed. 
Um, I didn't mention it under the war branch part of the watershed, but there is one dairy remaining in that watershed. That watershed has seen an extensive increase in poultry operations uh, over the, the past 10 or 12 years. And when I say extensive, I'm talking like six or seven new poultry operations and or expanded poultry operations in that section of the watershed. But they, they have been doing some best management practices to help properly contain their, their, their litter and, and manage their mortalities. So that's a little bit of back, uh, background about the, the watershed. Now this is kind of a busy map. I, I couldn't zoom in on it good without losing all of the key points I wanted to make, but this is a map from 2014 highlighting uh, a non-point uh, source assessment of uh, contributions by animal agriculture. And I've got yellow highlighted there. This is the Smith Creek watershed basically in, within that yellow circle. The darker the color here, the darker the red, the more concentrated the animals are. And of course, Rockingham County is the number one ag county in Virginia. Uh, that's because we have a large poultry, uh, a large poultry industry as well as beef cattle and dairies. Um, most of the dairies are in West Rockingham, kind of west of Dayton, the Bridgewater area. Uh, there's a few others scattered around the rest of the county. Uh, poultry is kind of spread around the county, but you can see in that area, even up in the Shenandoah County, that's kind of a paler red. So there's a lot of animals per acre, you know, when you, when you look at the watershed size. So because of that, we do have some, some water quality issues in the Smith Creek uh, watershed. Um, back in 1996, Smith Creek was added to the Virginia's impaired waters list due to bacteria, as well as uh, issues uh, dealing, uh, impacting aquatic life or, or macroinvertebrates um, or benthics as we call it. Um, and that was mainly because of sediment, uh, but also nutrients as, as well to a lesser extent. Um, in 2004, a TMDL was implemented for the Smith Creek watershed. And this is for the whole watershed, not just individual components of the watershed, for the whole watershed. And then in 2009, um, a TMDL implement, implementation plan was released to the public basically saying, all right, we've got this TMDL. Uh, a TMDL is basically a pollution diet. This is the amount of pollution that's in the watershed, and this is what we need to do to address it. That's what the plan's doing. So back in 2009, there's actually a big big public meeting at the 10th Legion Mountain Valley uh, Rearton Club. I was there, gave a, gave a presentation on uh, the benefits of getting livestock out of stream and some of the diseases that animals can, can contract from drinking contaminated water. Um, that was a really well attended event. Maybe some of you, some of you all were there, but it was a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. There were, there were kind of a core group of landowners in the watershed, as well as some nonprofit organizations, including Friends of the North Fork, um, my agency, um, the Soil and Water Districts um, were really involved to help get to see, see, to see this team uh, DL implementation plan implemented. So, caught a lot of attention. So, anyway. Um, water quality is regularly monitored in, regularly monitored in Smith Creek, um, totally regardless of the Smith Creek project. Um, and this information is available to the public. The USGS uh, has a monitoring or gauging station uh, in near, uh, just south of Mount Jackson, right on St uh, Smith Creek, the main stem. And you can go on there 24 hours a day and you can get kind of detailed historic data. And I, I've, what I've got here is just looking at, at flow, but you can look at actual real-time nitrate concentrations in the water. Um, you can look at water temperature. Uh, it, it's really cool. So um, if, if you uh, want to check this website out in your spare time, you can go just, just go to Google, type in Smith Creek Showcase Watershed. It's going to pop up a, a Smith Creek Showcase uh, Watershed website. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of that, in the middle, there's a USGS link. You can click that and it takes you right to this gauging station. Um, they're also, in addition to the real-time monitoring that's going on, they're also doing periodic uh, sampling around the watershed for some special projects, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, in addition, uh, DEQ is doing regular stream monitoring. Um, I've got a, a map here from 2009. It was the most current map I had, kind of indicating the different locations in the different sub-watersheds of Smith Creek that they sample. Um, I talked to Sarah Bottenfield, who, who is uh, with DEQ locally recently, and she gave me um, some different sites that they're looking at now. She's the uh, TMDL non-point source uh, pollution coordinator with DEQ locally out of their Valley Regional Office. And she said there's five gauging stations in Smith Creek that are not gauging stations, but five monitoring sites they go to regularly to, to look at bacteria levels and pH and conductivity and temperature and some other things. 
Um, in addition to that, there has been some some private uh, uh, analysis of water. Uh, the Friends of the Shandoah. Uh, I don't know if they're currently doing monitoring, but in the past, uh, they've been doing um, monitoring at several different sites throughout the Smith Creek watershed. But when I went to look for some data, I couldn't find anything that was current, uh, and, and their website didn't indicate that they were currently doing monitoring. It doesn't mean it's not happening. If, if it is, it's just not getting on their website. So um, that's kind of an overview of Smith Creek. Um, Smith Creek flows, of course, into the North Fork of the Shenandoah and North Fork of the Shenandoah and the South Fork of the Shenandoah combine at Front Royal uh, to form the main stem of the Shenandoah and at Harper's Ferry, that, that the, the main stem of the Shenandoah flows into the Potomac River and then the Potomac River flows into the Chesapeake Bay. And so everything we do here uh, in the headwaters uh, of, of the Bay Watershed impacts the, the Bay water quality. Um, so since the early 80s, there's been a big push on restoring the, the health of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, it is the nation's largest estuary and it's considered a national treasure. Um, and some people would say it's an international treasure. Um, so with all that, there's been a lot of work over the past almost 40 years to improve the Chesapeake Bay. Um, well, uh, at various times through that 40 year history, approximately 40 year history, there's been various movements to, to get the bay moving in the right direction. Well, uh, the most recent was in May of 2009, uh, President Obama at the time issued an executive order, Executive Order 15, or excuse me, 13508, uh, Chesapeake Bay Preservation and Restoration to focus federal resources on improving the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so he basically directed the executive branch of the government, hey, if, if this Chesapeake Bay, if it's applicable to you, you need to do something to clean it up. So, to help clean it up. So, USDA, um, what we did was, is we said, all right, we're gonna we're gonna do our part. We we were already through NRCS and some other federal agencies. We were already implementing conservation programs that can help improve water quality. What USDA said is, all right, NRCS, you're gonna take the lead on this and uh, work with other federal agencies as well as other, uh, both inside and outside of USDA. And so they designated three watersheds in the bay. Um, uh, watershed is showcase watersheds, and, and I'll get a little bit more about what that means in a second, but uh, we were notified this in late 2009. Um, I was at a meeting in Richmond and my state conservationist at the time, Jack Bricker, who's in the right of this photo, he walked up to me and said, Corey, he said, are you, are you working in Smith Creek? And I said, I, I, I was, and he said, how well do you know Smith Creek? And I, I told him, I said, I know it pretty well. And he said, well, you're gonna know it even better. He said, we're gonna, uh, the, the USDA, the secretary is gonna designate it a showcase watershed for conservation. And so uh, I just, at the time, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it in a little bit. I, I was like, okay, sounds good. I was, well, I don't know why I picked Smith Creek, but okay. So anyway, over the coming months, we met with teams, we met with partners and come up with a plan for Smith Creek. And then officially on June the 18th of 2010, we had a, a, a a showcase, a showcase designation event or public public event saying that uh, Smith Creek will be the showcase watershed for Virginia for demonstrating and improving water quality in Chesapeake Bay. And so uh, in this picture here, I have uh, Richard Fitzgerald. He was an agronomist or is an agronomist with the agency. He was our Smith Creek coordinator at the time. I have Ann Mills in the middle. Uh, she is, was the deputy uh, secretary or excuse me, the undersecretary for uh, natural resources and environment, which at the time was NRCS and the Forest Service under USDA. And then Jack Bricker, our state conservationist at the time. So um, in addition to Smith Creek, um, there were two other watersheds in the, in, the, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed drainage area that were designated showcases. So uh, Pennsylvania designated the Conewago uh, Creek. It's kind of on the western part of Lancaster County and, and flows into the Susquehanna River, about 34,000 acres, mixed use. And in Maryland, they des designated the upper Chester River, which is about 23,000 acres. As you can see, Smith Creek's pretty much almost double the other two watersheds. So the largest showcase watershed was is Smith Creek here in Virginia. Um, and this again was coming from the from the department, not from the agency. Um, this is kind of unusual. So what is a showcase watershed? So basically what they wanted us, to, what they meant by showcase is we're gonna show the public and we're gonna show other agencies and we're gonna show farmers that what we can do if we all work together as a partnership to implement conservation to improve water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. 
Um, and then we're basically going to we're going to break this into different different ways of how we're going to do it. Um, so why was Smith Creek picked as a showcase watershed? Remember, I said a minute ago I was kind of scratching my head. Why do we pick Smith Creek? I could think of other watersheds that that were more impaired, um, that, that needed better improvement. But the reason why they picked Smith Creek was because of the enthusiasm of the partners involved with the TMDL process. A lot of landowners were on board in the watershed. You had friends of the North Fork, you had Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Trout Unlimited. Um, many organizations were involved with the TMDL plan to help improve the water quality, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation at the time, the Virginia DEQ. So there was interest there and they saw potential, hey, we can make this a showcase, so to speak. So that, that's how Smith Creek was picked. Um, it was the strong partnership that was already in place in the watershed. Basically, there was a foundation there. All we had to do was build upon that foundation. So, over the over the, the basically mid 2010 on into early 2011, we did a lot of work internally within NRCS and, and a lot with a lot, of our, a lot of our close partners to figure out what are we going to do to make this truly a showcase. Um, and a lot of this was coming from the department level. You will do this. And some of it was a little bit outside of what we do. So we had to kind of tailor it to what we could and couldn't do. Um, so um, one thing they said is, and this came from the department, is you will, uh, at least I was told it came from the department when I asked, you will outreach to 100% of the farmers in the watershed. You're going you're gonna to get with direct outreach, one-on-one -on -one personal contact with 100% of the farmers in the watershed. Um, and uh, you, you know, we're going to document it. And this is basically was to let them know about the project, let them know what resources are available to do conservation, and uh, also importantly, to document any conservation that they've already done in operations so that that can maybe potentially be entered in the Chesapeake Bay model. Um, they wanted it to be a locally led process, so people on the ground locally making decisions. They didn't want people in Richmond or DC calling the shots. They wanted people locally making decisions. Um, they wanted conservation practice research and demonstration. So what conservation practices can we do that maybe aren't being done and maybe we can show, we can try them and see, get a, a subset of farmers that can try them and then they can show other farmers and it can kind of take off and expand. Um, they wanted farmer and landowner outreach and education, just about conservation and that sort of thing. They wanted to also up, uh, update and work with our partners on uh, conservation measures and, and, and outreach and, and, and teach them. Um, we also want to do some some public outreach and education to the general public who live in the watershed, but maybe they don't farm, but maybe they own land, or maybe they just they go to school in the watershed at one of the schools in the watershed. Um, we also want to do get the community involved with with conservation if we could too. We also want to highlight at least one farm more if possible um, that was implementing conservation practices and kind of show that off to others. Um, they also, more importantly, and kind of most important, and these are in no particular order, I've just got them listed in the order they came to my mind, um, but also they wanted us to, to work with our partners in the watershed to help further their mission uh, in improving water quality in the watershed. Um, and they wanted us to, to uh, also importantly, to implement conservation practices to help improve the water quality so ultimately we can show a success and be a model. They also wanted uh, water quality research conducted in, in, in the watershed. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more of each of these in here just a second. So initially, um, we worked with about 40 partners. We had some public meetings and about 40, 40 different partners showed up of various sorts. Um, and then some of those partners have still stayed with us today. Other, some of those organizations are no longer in existence or once they got to work with us, they said, well, it's not really anything that we can be involved with. Um, but I'll kind of show, show a little bit some of our key partners uh, get a little more detail about each of those in just a second. So in order to help coordinate this locally, we, we, we designated a Smith Creek coordinator, and this would be a person that would help kind of be the glue that holds the partnership together. Um, the, the, and I'll say, uh, I've got, you see Kathy home on her twice, bless her heart. Um, but basically, um, in, we were not able to, due to lack of funds, 
NRCS wanted to have these coordinators, but NRCS was not able to afford to pay these or to, to, to pay these coordinators just to have that as their sole job. So this, for each person in this position as a Smith Creek coordinator, it was always a collateral duty. So they had another job to do, but they were also a Smith Creek coordinator. So our first coordinator was Richard Fitzgerald, and he was an agronomist at the time. And he was very instrumental in working with us on some nutrient management and some cropland uh, items in the, in, the, in the early phases of the program. Um, after he stepped out of the position, Kathy Holmes stepped in. Um, Kathy Holmes was the coordinator uh, for four years. Um, she was a, a uh, was a former uh, Shenandoah RCND coordinator, and when the RCND program went away, she became a resource conservationist um, at, out of our area office. And she naturally had a lot of experience with coordinating partnerships through her position with RCND and some previous jobs. So she was a natural for the job, and she did a wonderful job. And then she, in 2015, got a promotion to the um, area conservationist or as on paper, the assistant state conservationist for field operations. So she had to relinquish her duties as a Smith Creek coordinator. So at that point, Philip Davis, who was a soil conservationist working under me at the time, um, took over that role. And then he later got a promotion to an area resource conservationist position, but he was able to still be the Smith Creek coordinator. Now, in kind of mid-2020, he left the agency to go to work with DEQ uh, to manage their low interest loan program for implementing BMPs on farms. So he had to leave, but he is still heavily involved today with the partnership. Um, and so at that point, Kathy Holm kind of stepped back in the role just in an acting position. And we're currently working on a grant, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, that hopefully we'll be able to hire a, a coordinator, at least on a few year basis, to, that their sole position will be to help coordinate activities in Smith Creek. So a little bit about what we did with the partnership. So remember I, I told you we had to have 100% outreach to farms, to farmers. Well, we were talking about doing surveys and this sort of thing. Well, we found out that NRCS, we could not do surveys. We're not, a, we're not the Census Bureau or anything like that. No, ag statistics. So we had to call farm inventories because that's what we do when we work with farmers. We inventory resources on our farm and figure out if those resources are degraded or not, then help provide solutions to correct them if they are. So we conducted farm inventories. And remember, they wanted us to do 100% outreach. So over a three year period, um, we, were, we, we determined through various analysis and lots of data sorting, there are about 495 unique individual farmers in the in the watershed between the Rockingham and Shandell County portions. Um, over a three year period, we were able to meet with 349 of those farmers and inventory their resources on the farm and, and collect information. Um, at which time uh, in, in 2013, they said, well, our time is probably better spent doing other things. We've, we've got the bulk of them, of the farms uh, inventory. Um, so this is a big process, but this was a great process. We got to meet and work with a lot of folks that we had not worked with before. We did some cold calling, knocking on doors, asking, hey, this we know this person's your brother. We've never worked with them. Can you maybe give us a shoe in with them? And um, one benefit that I'll say of meeting with all these folks is that we got a lot of conservation on the ground because of it, because people, we, we were able to tell them about the program, tell them about some financial assistance available. And then they maybe not right away signed up, but, but in time came and, and signed up. Uh, to do something. So that was unique um, and, and really enjoyed that kind of a networking thing. So the other thing we did, I mentioned this is going to be locally led. So what we decided to do was implement what we call a farmer sounding board. So we got six farmers and maybe seven. Um, the one person was kind of in and out a little bit. Uh, four farmers from Rockingham and in, uh, at least two, maybe three from Shenandoah County that basically we were, we would run ideas across them what we were wanting to do and they'd say, yeah, I think that's a good idea or no, I don't think that's a good idea. And we, we relied on them for two, two and a half years till we really got the project up and running. And then at that point, we all said, hey, they all said, hey, if you need us, just call us. You know, we you guys are doing good with this. But we, we, we talked about field days, projects to research and, and demonstrate certain conservation practices. It was, it was really good. A lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings, a lot of phone calls. We, we met together as a group a good bit, but we also do, just made individual contacts with these folks as needed just to, just to run things by them. Um, uh, we also uh, did a number of conservation research and demonstration projects. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Richard Fitzgerald as an agronomist wanted us to focus on nutrient management, ways we can reduce nutrients, but still get good crop yields. Uh, the way, ways we can improve soil health, which directly improves water quality. If you're taking care of the soils, you're reducing runoff and holding nutrients. 
uh, in place, plus your increase in organic matter and, and hopefully yields. Um, over the course of the of the of this program of the Smith Creek Watership Program, um, we've done at least thirteen demonstration research projects. Most of them are re related to cover crops and no-till nutrient management. We, we, but we've also done some uh, some grazing, some intensive grazing, rotational grazing demonstration projects. Um, this is one of my personal favorite parts of this this program is uh, this this partnership program was working with um, these demonstration and research projects. We did a lot of legwork, work one-on-one work, work with farmers. We worked with uh, partners to get seed donated, get fertilizer cost coverage because farmers doing this were taking a risk. They were taking productive land sort of out of production, and they may stand to lose yield. Um, or lose money with the project, but in every case, people people actually gained higher yields or had lower input costs, which uh, ultimately helped them in increase their yields. Just a picture of some different cover crop plots that we planted in one of our projects. Um, we did some field days uh, generally to show off what we what we did with the demonstration. So basically, demonstrating that this conservation practice would work, and in some cases, demonstrating that hey, we had a good idea, but it just didn't work out. You definitely don't want to try this on your farm, or maybe you should try it and see if you have better results than we did with it. Um, the other thing we want to do was educate the farmers in the watershed on all sorts of topics: conservation, installing conservation practices. So um, here, we, we in, in early 2011, we, we worked with uh, Extension and Virginia Forge and Grassland Council, and we actually uh, did a farmer uh, workshop for how to build fence properly, um, and particularly stream exclusion fence uh, and fences for conservation projects. Um, great, we've, we've done a number of these farmer education events over the years. Um, some of them is, is only for farmers. Some of them you get farmers and agency folks coming. Sometimes you get school groups coming, college kids, that sort of thing. But these have been fun. The other thing we did um, just to help reach out to folks is we also did some farmer breakfasts. We did, I think, three or four of these back in 2011 and then again in 2012 just to get the farmers in, serve them breakfast, talk, talk about the watershed project. Um, we also did a, a dinner meeting one night in town um, at a restaurant and we had the US folks from the US Geological Survey come in and to talk about some of the research they were doing. Um, so basically we want to keep farmers in the loop with, with the program and, and also let them know what was available to help them with this, this, this project. Um, again, we done a, 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 did a number of field days for farmers. We, we've done at least 17 uh, farmer outreach events throughout the course of the, the Smith Creek uh, Showcase Watershed event. A matter of fact, we had one today on Valley View Farms in the War Branch section of the watershed. Uh, well over 100 folks came out to that. Now, there were agency folks, farmers, as well as some school groups, but talking about nutrient management, uh, agronomy, like uh, uh, cover cropping systems, as well as some pasture management things. So still very, very something we're very much interested in, so, something we're very much um, trying with. Now, one thing about this, we're not just getting farmers from Smith Creek, we're getting farmers from around the region. So Smith Creek, while it's, we're focusing on Smith Creek, we're benefiting farmers region wide. Um, so we also mentioned we want to, we want to educate um, farmers who are, uh, are not farmers, but agency partners. Um, and also partner organization folks. So we've done a number of workshops over the years for them, for those folks. Um, here, here's an example, we were on the Deskins property there in the Lacey Springs area, Rockingham County, talking about stream bank restoration work. And we actually worked with them to plant some, some willows in the stream bank. And we planted about an acre or so of riparian forest buffer, just to, just to show those folks how to properly plant trees and how to properly do stream bank work. Um, we had folks from, uh, at the time, uh, Game Linder Fisheries, now Department of Wildlife Resources, they came in, shocked fish, excuse me, in the stream there, just to see kind of what the stream health was looking like. Um, we've, we've Sometimes I mentioned when we were doing these demonstration projects, we get agency folks in to show them, hey, this is what we're doing, planting this rate of cover crop. This is the yield of corn we're getting following this cover crop. This is the amount of nitrogen we were able to cut back. And so there, there, we get farmers, or not not farmers, but but agency folks coming from all over the state to these meetings, uh, sometimes, and so they can take it back to their respective uh, soil and water conservation districts or their respective NRCS office, and and share with their farmers what they've learned from 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 our experiences and stuff. Or hey, they did something similar and they had totally different results, and so we try to work out you know maybe what 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 the differences were. Um, I mentioned we also want to engage the general public, so. 
Uh, another fun, fun part of this project is we've done um, four uh, what we call family fun days and, and Friends of the North Fork's been a big uh, supporter of this. We've done two in Shenandoah County and then two in Rockingham County um, over the 12 year period of the Smith Creek Showcase Watershed Project. Um, basically, we get kids out, let them play in the creek, we catch some macroinvertebrates, we fish, um, we have all kinds of wildlife topics. We've had folks in the wildlife center come in and bring raptors uh, to talk about, you know, you know, these are all animals maybe that have been injured and then are recovered um, or animals that can't be released because of their injuries and they use them for education purposes. These have been great events and, and sometimes they can attract over 100 folks to come out on a Saturday morning or afternoon and just learn about nature, learn about water quality. Um, so these have been really good. We've also uh, created a website so you can learn about the Smith Creek Showcase Watershed um, with all kinds of resources for the general public um, as well as for farmers. Uh, early on in the project, we were doing uh, Smith Creek newsletters, we called them, and we were mainly mailing this, these to farmers or large landowners um, in the watershed, but um, the Shenandoah Valley Soil and Water Conservation District, they also did some, they had an urban grant to do urban work in Smith Creek. And when I say urban, I'm talking about like homeowner work, like septic replacement, septic pump outs, um, replacing straight pipes, that sort of thing. So they did identify landowners that uh, based off of county GIS records and mailed mailers of them about septic health and stuff like that, what was available in, in technically and financial assistance. So um, we also mentioned that uh, I also mentioned that we wanted to get the community as a whole involved in conservation. So we were able to do that with, with a series of volunteer events. And so over the, the 12 year history of the Smith Creek project, um, we've done five volunteer tree planting events in the watershed where we've went to a conservation project where the, the, the last practice usually remaining was to plant a forested buffer. And so um, with these five events that we've done, over the 12 years, we've had about 270 volunteers come in and they've planted about um, uh, almost nine acres of trees uh, on these projects. We've also done some buffer cleanup projects. And here's a picture there uh, on the Yancey farm in Rockingham County where we went in and, and did um, a large buffer planting and basically the center part of the farm that was kind of in the core of the buffer was a series of old beef feed lots and holding pens and stuff. So we had all this old fence, old feed troughs right in the middle of all this beautiful buffer. So the landowner was really concerned about the cost because the overall project was over budget. So I said, hey, I got some some folks uh, from JMU that I know that want to do some, some uh, environmental uh, outreach and, and volunteer type activities. We can get them in here. So we organized an official event, came in, we removed all the fence in a day. We had a, a local, another farmer locally come in, bringing uh, some equipment in to help us pull fence posts. We took boards off, we took wire down, um, and then we planted some trees when it was all said and done. But we've done, like I said, two buffer cleanup events where we've had about 60, a little over 60 volunteers help with that. And we've cleaned up about 14 and a half acres of buffer. Um, and some other projects we've went into established buffers and removed trash that's washed in from upstream. We've removed shelters from trees. Uh, maybe a tree was uh, a log or something went up against it during a high flow event. We removed that log, tried to stand the tree back up if we could. Um, but getting the, the community involved is certainly a, a way to get buy-in from the general public, just having these volunteer events. Um, so we also wanted to showcase conservation projects that were installed. And so um, I mentioned the Yancey farm where we did the buffer cleanup, but we used that as our showcase for conservation in the Smith Creek watershed initially. And we've, we've since showcased some other projects, but this was kind of our, our showcase project, we called it. And on that farm is, is over 200 acres of pasture land and some cropland, um, beef cattle, um, some, some barns and other infrastructure that livestock are being fed in. Um, the, the headwater spring of Smith Creek starts on this farm. So we fenced that out um, and then established a, a forested buffer around it, uh, put in some walkways and some stream crossings to get the livestock back to the barn. Um, again, we had the volunteer event to, rem to remove some of the trash and old debris from the buffer area uh, so that it there were old fences and stuff would not be a barrier to wildlife movement. Um, and just it'd be kind of unsightly. But overall on this project, we, we planted almost 25 acres of forested buffer. Uh, so really good project. We put in a rotational grazing system for the livestock to be able to be rotated through pastures that included uh, cross fence, some stream crossings, uh, as well as an automatic watering system um, on the property. 
Um, here's an example of one of the walkways we put into the barn uh, to be able to get uh, livestock back into the barn to feed and or to work or to, to haul in or out. Um, and again, we had that volunteer cleanup um, event there and then plant trees when we were done getting the buffer cleaned up. And then here's kind of a after picture a couple years after the trees were planted. You can see this is the stream flowing out of the large spring and then you can see some trees and stuff starting to come up. So the other part of this project was, of course, working with our partners and that's key. And so what we did there was is we started having, uh, we started out initially with with quarterly partnership meetings where we would get together and talk about, hey, what are we doing? What do you need help with? We, hey, we need help with this. And uh, as time went on, we, we, we sometimes we meet quarterly, sometimes we would meet semi-annually, sometimes we would meet just three times a year, just depending on what all was going on with everybody's schedules and stuff like that. But they were always announced in advance and we always had highlights of what was going on and stuff like that. Um, here's just, here's just pictures of the various partnership meetings that we've had. Um, but in addition to having just meetings to talk about things, we also work together on projects um, jointly um, and have each other's back, so to speak. And so this is just a, a slide showing the, 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 the logos of the different agencies that we've worked with. I'm not going to read them all off individually, but and in, in, again, this is not an all inclusive list, but these are some of the key partners that were particular today that we're currently working with in, in the Smith Creek watershed. Um, so as you can see here, there's some federal agencies, um, as well as some state agencies, um, some, some educational institutions, um, and then also several nonprofit organizations, um, as well as some, some county governments and town governments and, and city governments. Um, and so I can't, I can't go, with, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the, our other key partner in this project is the, is the farmers and landowners in the watershed because the whole focus was on, on improving water quality on private land. And so if we don't have our farmers and landowners on board, they're not going to implement conservation. And so they are a key partner to this that, that often gets overlooked, but I always make sure to mention that these farmers and landowners are key to the success of the Smith Creek project is because they're the ones that actually took the initiative and the interest to install the conservation practices on, on, their, on their own properties or the land that they rent or manage. Um, um, so basically the other part of this program was we, we wanted to actually provide financial and technical assistance to, in addition to all the education and outreach to actually implement conservation practices on the landscape. So we use several key farm bill programs that NRCS administers um, over multiple farm bills, I guess when you think of it, we're, we're working on, I guess, the third farm bill that we did in 2008, 2014, and the 2018 farm bills to implement some of our, our conservation in the, in the watershed using federal dollars. So Chesapeake Bay Watershed Initiative, uh, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, our Regional uh, Conservation Partnership Program, as well as the Conservation Stewardship Program are kind of the key NRCS programs that we use in the watershed. But in addition to that, there's some other federal conservation programs, the CREP program, that's the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, or the Wildlife Habitat Improvement Program or Incentives Program, WIP, the Wetland Reserve Program. Those are all other federal programs under the Farm Bill. Uh, WIP is no longer in existence. It got merged with EQIP. Um, and WRP is now part of a different program. We call it WRE of the ASEP program, Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. But in addition to that, there was private money pumped into the watershed. Um, there was state money. Uh, through the, the Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program. Um, there was federal money coming through EPA through the 319 program. Uh, that went primarily to the Soil and Water District to do some urban work, again, working on some septic system uh, replacements and upgrades and pump outs. The National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has been both directly and indirectly involved in this project with, with funding. Um, we have private money for fencing uh, through the flexible fencing program that was uh, administered by the Valley Conservation Council and prior to that when it was in existence the Shandell RC&D um, that money came through the Bay Funders Network. Um, the Valley Conservation Council has worked with landowners on helping cover the cost of some conservation easements in the watershed so a, a lot of financial dollars have been thrown into Smith Creek to to do. Um, with that said, I'll, I'll still say here, say here today and tell you guys, we don't have enough funding to do all the projects that we'd like to do. We still have a little bit of a backlog of projects in the watershed. 
just kind of a background on some of the things we did. I did mention earlier, kind of talking about the watershed, there's a lot of animal agriculture in, a lot of, in the watershed. And when you have a lot of animals, you have manure to deal with. And so um, there are some, some beef cattle feeding operations in the watershed. And so those can be, you know, while it's considered non-point uh, uh, non source pollution, some of these beef feedlots can actually be a point source because you can you can see the manure flowing from them right to a stream or in a channel that leads to the stream or into a sinkhole or into a fractured limestone rock. So pictured here is like a what we call a bedded pack facility. This is like replacing an outdoor feedlot. The animals are just confined inside and the building is serving as manure storage. And then they can later take that manure and, and clean it out and apply it to cropland instead of just leaving it on a feedlot before where it's not easily extractable. Um, we've actually done 31 different animal waste related projects um, in the watershed. Um, over the course of the 12 years we've been working as part of the, the project. Um, we've done a good bit of stream fencing and I wish I had some statistics to give to you as far as stream fencing, as far as footages, but unfortunately in our tracking systems, fence is a linear foot practice and we have no way to distinguish whether it's a stream fence or a cross fence, but we're working on getting that. Um, and also as far as acres excluded along the streams, uh, we, we also exclude animals from woods and other sensitive areas. And so those acres are all tied together. So we got to have somebody that could take the time to extract that. But nonetheless, we've done a lot of water exclusion from livestock in the watershed. Um, we've, we've then implemented grazing systems to, to better manage the upland areas of the farm so that we're reducing the runoff to the streams. Um, we've planted buffers to help uh, filter out any overland flow. Um, or, you know, to plant trees, hopefully that those roots can take up nutrients that are in the water. Um, we've done some stream bank restoration work. We've done uh, three stream bank projects, um, two of them specifically with the goal of helping to stabilize the stream banks, but also to also improve aquatic organism habitat, uh, mainly with brook trout in mind. Because, uh, because of the large stream, uh, springs in the watershed, um, the, the water temperature is actually cool enough in segments of the watershed that we can support uh, brook trout. Um, in some places they even reproduce, which is really cool. Um, uh, we've also done, as I've mentioned, uh, a lot of nutrient management work, uh, putting the proper amount of nutrients down at the right place in the right time. So we're not having runoff or leaching, uh, a lot of cover crops to improve soil health and to stop soil erosion. Um, as well as like reduced tillage systems. Some other things we've done is worked on wildlife habitat, um, uh, converting cropland to wildlife habitat, converting pasture to wildlife habitat, just taking it to a less intensive use. Um, we've done high tunnels to help uh, local food production. Um, and some people say, well, what's the conservation benefit of a high tunnel? But I'm here to tell you a farm that is more profitable um, is gonna do more conservation. And a high tunnel, if managed, uh, managed appropriately, will actually greatly increase the, the net profit on the farm. And so those, those farms, a lot of those in the watershed that we've helped those with have done more conservation as a result. Um, so um, we've also wanted a conducting of water quality research um, as a part of this project. And so this is where our partners really shine. Um, and uh, mainly um, three that come to mind for the Soil and Water District to start with, they did some water, uh, water quality monitoring, just kind of in-house, just looking at ethical coliform levels on some projects. Um, some folks at JMU have done research, Virginia Tech has done some research, um, Friends of the Shenandoah has done some research, um, DEQ is doing ongoing research, and then of course the U.S. Geological Survey has done some, some ongoing research. Some of that information is still being studied and it isn't published, but I'm telling you the stuff that is published is absolutely interesting. And one thing, I've kind of mentioned it, um, this is from a published study about uh, nitrate in, in the watershed. And Smith Creek has a continuous nitrate gauge on the, the stream monitoring station that USGS has towards the, the end of the watershed. But what they found is the, the springs in the watershed in the limestone areas, in the karst areas, are really high contributors of nitrate to the surface water. So, um, and this is where it's really cool. They've actually taken in the Lacey Spring uh, scenario, remember I said earlier that Dry Fork is, has been found to feed Lacey Springs. They have found that the nitrate in that through some, some radioisotope analysis is actually from organic origin. And by that, I mean that it came from an animal. Um, they can't tell you whether it came from a cow or a chicken or a person, but it, it came from an animal. Um, 
and it's not from commercial fertilizer that was bought. So um, that's pretty significant. They've also been able to age the water based on tritium content uh, coming out of that spring to say that the average age of the water leaving that spring is at least 10 years old. Um, and so that's saying that stuff that happened on the landscape in, in the dry fork watershed and the other watersheds that land area that feeds Lacey Spring, things that happened 10 years ago are still influencing the water quality now. So that's why I said earlier, it could take a long, long time, even if we get all the BMPs implemented that we need for the water quality to improve. And that's because we have legacy uh, contamination to our groundwater. Um, so it's really neat. They've also done some sediment studies in the watershed, looking at where the sediment is coming from. Um, and they found um, uh, that a lot of it's coming from stream bank erosion. And it's just staying in the system. Um, Alan Gillis has got a report on that. And for the sake of time, I mean, we could do a whole segment just on talking to you about USGS research in the watershed. Um, but I just, th this, this groundwater study is, I've, karst has always fascinated me. I think it's just because it's the unknown. We don't know what's going on underneath our feet. But the fact that something that happened on the landscape 10 years ago in an example of Lacey Spring is, is still influencing the water coming out today. That, that in my mind is just, it's really fascinating. Um, some recent projects that we've done in Smith Creek, um, uh, kind of an up and coming practice in the region is what we call a bioreactor. And so this project, you know, kind of ties into what I was saying about the nitrate. So the Smith Creek spring has nitrates. I think it's on an average of about six or seven parts per million um, coming out of the spring. And so what they can do is with a bioreactor, they can run that spring water through a, a wood chip bed. It's an anaerobic process. Um, as the water filters through those wood chips, the, the anaerobic bacteria in there, they are stripping the nitrogen out of um, the, the water and then releasing it as nitrogen gas. And then the water's coming out to the end, you know, pretty much, I think it can get up to 90% reduction. The only thing about it is that the, uh, they, the, that spring is so large, they can't treat the whole spring, but they can remove, you know, hundreds of pounds of nitrogen per year, just at this site. And the lifespan on these bioreactors is, is you know, sometimes, 20 plus years. Um, as long as it stays anaerobic and it doesn't get oxygen in the system, and, you, and if you get oxygen, it turns aerobic and you get decomposition of the wood chips. Um, really neat. Um, another thing to highlight recently in the watershed is we had our um, 10 year celebration in the fall of 2020 um, out at uh, Valley Pike Farm, the same farm where we had our uh, initial, you know, celebration and announcing the Smith Creek Showcase Watershed. Um, Valley Pike Farm is actually the farm of the Lohr family, uh, Matt Lohr uh, and his parents, Gary and Ellen. Um, we had the, the, the showcase, uh, you know, announcement there in 2010 because of the conservation work they've been doing on the farm. We felt like it'd be good to showcase some of that. And then again, in 2020, when we were going to celebrate 10 years, have a birthday party, you know, this is the, the families continue to do ongoing conservation on the farm. We thought it'd be a good place to sh show off. Now, incidentally, and not related to the fact that why we want to have this event there, but Matt Lohr actually served as the chief of NRCS for two years of the Trump administration. But um, we tell everybody that had nothing to do with it. We would have had the event there regardless, just because it's such a beautiful place. It's central in the watershed and there's so much to see in the form of conservation. So a lot of folks come out and it was really nice to just celebrate what we've done and one of the good things about this event, we're, we're still kind of in the early stages of the pandemic. And this is kind of the first public event for a lot of folks. You can see in the picture, we're all socially distanced. I mean, wearing masks and that sort of thing. So that was a really good event. Um, and it just highlighted the, 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 the great partnership of this project. Another cool recent project that we've done, um, we work with a graduate student at JMU, um, Julia Portman. And she did a macro invertebrate study of segments of the stream where conservation had been uh, installed stream side, where they had excluded livestock, maybe done some stream bank restoration work. Um, she also studied some farm work had not been done yet. And actually at, our, at the Shenandoah Valley Soil and Water Conservation District meeting today, she gave a presentation of her results. They are phenomenal. It, it, she showed, and I don't wanna steal her thunder because we're gonna, we're gonna try to do a public event uh, uh, in a Zoom forum uh, coming up sometime in the in the coming month or two to highlight this 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 project and, and the work that she and her her uh, uh, colleagues and stuff worked on, um, but basically what they found was is that getting the cattle out of the streams, letting the stream banks heal, the more time it goes by, the more the macro invertebrate population comes back, and in, in the and of course those are an indicator of of good water quality. Um, even if there's a farm upstream that has not done work yet, 
even the segment of stream that has been fenced can just in that, even that short segment can show improvement. So that, that's awesome. It, really great. I was taken back by her presentation today. So look for an announcement to be coming on that soon if you're interested in, in learning a little bit about it. Um, another project is kind of ongoing um, is with uh, Virginia Tech's uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation working in, con uh, in um, tandem with the U.S. Geological Survey not just in Smith Creek, but basically from Rockbridge County all the way up into Jefferson County, uh, West Virginia. Um, they're looking at um, macro invertebrates in the stream and, and also kind of similar to what Julia Portman, Portman was doing, but just on a larger scale across multiple watersheds, you know, our BMPs helping improve the stream health uh, in the short and the long term. So there, there were several sites in um, Smith Creek that, that were part of this project. It's, it's ongoing. Um, Greg No with USGS um, is, the, is the lead there at USGS, and then we worked with Joe Buckwalter at Virginia Tech. I believe he's a grad student there, but we helped. They told us the string segments they were looking for or look, interested in looking at based on some uh, geographic information analysis they did, and then we, we got them in contact with the landowners to get them on the farms. And so some of the same sites that Julia Portman worked on, actually USGS and Virginia Tech were there too at different times. Um, Another thing that we did with JMU uh, three years ago now um, with uh, Dr. Corey uh, Hickerson, he's in the School of Communication Studies there at JMU, was kind of branding a logo and a concept for the project. And these, these students are in communications, are do they're doing marketing and that sort of thing. We met with them, told them about the project. They, we gave them like a, a kind of a presentation similar to what I'm giving to you all this evening about the Showcase Watershed, told them about it and then gave them a bunch of details and they went out for a semester. Um, these are all grad students and met with farmers in the watershed, just talk to stakeholders, talk, talk to partners. And they come up with the Smith Creek lo uh, logo that I've actually been using in my presentation tonight and came up with this kind of catchy uh, logo of showcase conservation, showcase collaboration and showcase community. Um, and actually one of the grad students, after she finished this course, she, she volunteered with us for about three or four months just helping finish up that she did a newsletter got that out to some landowners to help us with some outreach events so this is a really cool project um and again came up with a really nice logo um another project that's ongoing um is with the water sciences institute um they're part of the franklin and marshall college up in lancaster pennsylvania um uh, we're working with joe sweeney on this um they are doing um a lidar analysis of uh, old mule sites in the watershed, and they're studying legacy sediments, so sediment that has eroded off the landscape and is basically stuck in the stream system. Um, and this is a picture of the Sellers Farm there in, in the uh, Mosey area of the watershed, kind of just south of 10th Legion. You're looking kind of northeast here in this photo. Um, but they got three sites in particular they're studying, but I think they're also studying some others, but three in particular, and they're using drones and taking LIDAR from drones and they're going back and, and doing some detailed analysis. This project is ongoing and they don't really have anything to share yet. But they have done a lot of this type of stuff up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on some old mill pond sites. And it's phenomenal the, the amount of sediment they've been able to, to look at. Like you just look at the landscape, you don't know it's there, but then once they do the analysis, they can tell you where the dam was, where the races were and all that, just for the highly detailed LIDAR that they're getting. So what's, what's coming up with Smith Creek? So, you know, obviously we still have a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of animals in the stream. There's still some, some animal waste issues in the watershed. There's more nutrient management work to do. Um, so we still have our jobs ahead of us to, to work with farmers to get more livestock fenced out of streams. There's a lot of interest in folks and, and we're kind of serving them as a, servicing those folks, getting conservation plans written, uh, written for them and getting them in the process of applying for financial assistance to do those projects. Kind of something that I'm really excited about is the Smith Creek partnership um, through the Shenandoah Conservation Collaborative, which is administered by the Alliance for the Shenandoah Valley. That's a mouthful. I'm sorry for the overwhelming there, but we applied for as a partnership um, a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant to, to hopefully be able to hire a Smith Creek coordinator um, to do to do more public outreach and education in the watershed, to do more conservation demonstration projects, and to get more conservation on the ground. And another thing about this is to look at, can we apply this concept to, to another watershed in the region and replicate this? Um, and so 
that's a minor component of that overall project. So we're hoping to find out uh, any time now whether that project was actually approved for funding or not, but we're really excited about that. Um, we've got more uh, research and demonstration projects in the works. I mentioned today that there was a field day that was talking about some poultry litter injection, planting cover crop mixtures, um, different types of rotational grazing, uh, different levels of intensity. So we've got some more of those in the works and, and, and uh, hopefully if we can get that NIFWIT uh, project approved, we'll, we'll be able to do more demonstration projects, uh, particularly mainly to, uh, uh, related to pasture management. And that, that's our hope. Um, uh, more bioreactors in the watershed. And that's also a component maybe of this NIF NIFWIT grant that we've, come, that we've wrote. But we've, we've worked with, and I failed to mention the partner, we've worked with an outfit called Ridge to Reefs um, on this. And um, this is a picture of the bioreactor I mentioned to Peyton Yancey. This is while it's under construction. They're putting the liner in it. Um, but there's other springs in the watershed that are contaminated with nitrates. And so we're looking for more, more landers that are willing to do these. And hopefully, hopefully with them, we can, we can reduce the nitrate levels in, in the water. Um, Drew Coslow was our main contact there with Ridge to Reefs. Great, great person, very knowledgeable on, on bioreactors. Uh, we have a lot of conservation practices still on the books that haven't been installed. We have um, one stream bank restoration project in Rockingham County. It's going to be done in two phases, hopefully, to be done later this year uh, on one of the headwater streams. Um, some animal waste projects in the works, as well as some grazing systems and, and stream exclusion projects. Um, I'd, I'd be remiss if I did not mention that we, we've had a number of successes uh, with this project, and I can't, I could do a whole presentation just on the successes, but one of our, one that we're most proud, proudest of is during the course of the Smith Creek Showcase Watershed, um, a segment of the mountain, or basically the mountain run portion of uh, Smith Creek Watershed was able to be delisted uh, by EPA um, for its aquatic uh, habitat impairment, the benthics. Um, so basically with stream exclusion, some other BMPs, um, the stream quality improved enough that the level of macroinvertebrates present in the stream in increased greatly to the point that it was no longer considered impaired. So um, EPA back in 2018 did a success story on this. And of course, DEQ and in the Soil and Water District are heavily involved with this. And this is just a slide showing the segments. Here's Fridley's Gap, Fridley's Run. These blue highlighted sections here are the stream segments that were delisted for a uh, aquatic life impairment. So we're excited about that. And we're hoping to see more as time goes on. Um, so what's my takeaways uh, from the Smith Creek project? Um, these are my personal takeaways. One thing, the first thing I'm gonna say is, if you would have asked me in, in December of 2009 when Jack Bricker, our state conservationist, let me know about Smith Creek, if, if you would have asked me then how, and, I, and I, I'm a very optimistic person, I'm always looking for the good in things and looking on the bright side, um, just trying to be positive. But, but then when I was told about what we we're gonna do, I'm like, oh my, I, don't, I just don't know if this project is gonna be successful, you know, but man, you know, I got it wrong. This project has been super successful and is certainly a model uh, for the Chesapeake Bay, what it was the intended purpose was. Um, there's, do we have more to do? Yes, we have a lot more work to do, but we've come a long way and we've, we've been a good influence for a lot of nonprofit groups around the Bay region and for other regions outside the Chesapeake Bay, even of partners working in collaborative or together in collaboration to get work done. Um, so, um, Basically, with that said, the other, the other takeaway is is that many hands make for lighter work, and this is a good example. We're doing a volunteer tree planting here on Suzy Q Farm uh, uh, on a stream bank restoration project. You know, many people there make planting of a few hundred trees go very quick, and so that the same applies to the Smith Creek Showcase Watershed. Many partners working together make the job easier and make it even seem like it's not work. Um, it's just it's del delightful to work with and, and to do, and so. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time, uh, part, uh, conservation is a partnership effort. Uh, no one person or one single agency, organization, uh, or government unit, or whatever you want to say, no one person or organization can do conservation by themselves. You have to work in tandem, work in collaboration to get the job done. Um, and you, you, you work off of each other's strengths and weaknesses. Um, the other thing um, I can say is that uh, 
you know, this, this project can certainly be a model for other watersheds and kind of getting back to what I was saying about the proposed NIFWIF grant that's out there is, can we take this and work in another local watershed in, in the area? I'm, I'm thinking that, that we can certainly do that. Um, and so um, this, this program in the end, when it's all said and done, the biggest takeaway is this, this project has far exceeded its goal in, in my mind and my professional opinion, but we've benefited so much more than just the farmers and agricultural landowners in this, in this watershed. We've, we've benefited the general public, um, in, both directly and indirectly with you know, improving the water quality, um, educating them, getting people out there helping with the conservation. Um, but uh, we, 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 went, we went far outside the boundaries of this watershed. Um, one thing that is a big success for me, I don't know if anybody knows, our agency puts out a grazing calendar every year. We call it the Virginia Grazers Planner. That is a direct result of the Smith Creek Showcase Watershed Project and, and specifically a grant that we had within internal within our CS to do outreach on in Smith Creek and some other watersheds, but part of that project was to do grazing outreach. And we thought, what better tool than to get something on a calendar as you can have on your wallet, you can look at you know, different tips each month. So we started that the first the, the first year of that calendar was 2011. And, and this year we, we, we've done one all the way through to 2022 and hoping to continue that into the future. So this, this project has benefited more than just Smith Creek. It has benefited the region and farmers around the state and even other states. So uh, with that, I'll stop talking, talking and, and hopefully I haven't bored you all to tears. And uh, as you can tell, I get pretty excited about Smith Creek. Um, and I'll, I'll open it up to any questions that, that folks may have. Hopefully everybody's still awake. I guess I have a question to start things off. Um, is what do you feel like was your most successful outreach strategy of just getting farmers initial interest in conservation and in just learning about what was available? Um, I would say, I would say probably the, the, the uh, do two things. We, we, we had these public meetings like the farmer breakfast, just, Hey, it's like, what are you doing Saturday morning? We called them up on the phone. What are you doing Saturday morning? Hey, come down to the mountain Valley 10th Legion Rurton club or come down to the new market firehouse. We're going to have breakfast for you. We got them there and just, we had their we had their ears while they were eating for a half hour 45 minutes and uh, i think one day was a rainy day so nobody wanted to go it was a cold day nobody wanted to go home and feed and stuff so they shot the bull we talked about programs those those events got us a lot of projects and then doing those one-on-one -on -one farmer inventories i think that was another thing that was really instrumental to to the success of this project we we're getting out there sitting with people um I tell people you know, that I know of, I, I wasn't me, but, but two of my staff members, one person told them to leave. They didn't want them there because they were from the government. But then they, they, as they were going out the driveway, they chased them down and told them to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and then we ended up doing several conservation projects on that farm and, and it's somebody we had never worked with before. And then another project person got told to leave, but then later he left his business card and, and the, 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 the landowner emailed him and then invited him to come out like a week later. So uh, that that that's cool you know that's just that those to me are the two single biggest like successes getting directly to the farmers so nice thank you i did yeah. have a another question from chris in the audience who asked whether you've slept in the last 12 years <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife would tell you not enough um <laughs> So, but I, I do, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a night owl. I like to work in the evenings. I can get more work done in the evenings when I don't have a lot of, I'm easily distracted. So, but, but yeah, it's been, it's been a passion. It's been a lot of work and it, I haven't considered it actual work because I've, I've enjoyed what I'm doing. So I haven't got enough sleep, Chris. <laughs> My wife would say that anyway. Any Oh, hey, Corey, I wanted to ask you here. Um, you were mentioning some of the, you know, electroshocking being done. Has there been any kind of continued efforts for electroshocking? Uh, it'd be really interesting to see, you know, how the changes in the fish population follows the changes in macroinvertebrates. Uh, and specifically looking at those brook, uh, brook trout, especially, I feel like that would kind of be the, 
in my mind, the ultimate success, but I'm biased. Uh, but, you know, if you can support spawning brook trout, that's, you know, something that'd be phenomenal or even just support brook trout period, even if they're not able to spawn necessarily. So that's a really good question, Matt. So to my knowledge, the main study that I'm aware of on the brook trout was done by Mark Huddy, who was with kind of jointly with the U.S. Forest Service, as well as um, JMU. Um, and, and he did some some studies on the upper part of the, the main stem of Smith Creek and also up Mountain Run in the Fredley's Gap. Um, and to my knowledge, outside of his research, there hasn't been really anything done. Um, but that is that is a great topic. I, I agree with you, Matt. It'd be really nice to know because once you get those macro invertebrates, vertebrates, they're kind of the foundational species. A lot, a lot of other aquatic organisms are built upon their populations. So um, it'd be really neat to see. We've we've done for some education events. We've we've went in and and, sh and had the Department of Wildlife Resources sh shock force just to get some stuff in the in the tanks for the kids to look at. Um, and also, I mentioned we did an agency training on, on riparian areas. We had them come and shock some fish for us. And uh, pretty neat. And I, that, that particular event, there was one rare fish or uncommon fish that they found. And I can't remember what it was that even the, the fisheries biologists were, were surprised to, to see it so far upstream. But I can't remember what it was. It was usually they find it lower in the watershed, they thought. Nice. Any any other questions here? Not to keep taking your time here, uh, but if no one else has questions, I'll ask another one. Um, so you were talking about the, you know, kind of almost sounds like inherent high nitrogen uh, within the area. Um, so does that, you know, seem more like a natural thing uh, that's kind of occurred? Or is that something that's kind of built up over, you know, hundreds of years of agriculture here um, kind of thing? So that's a really good question, and 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 so um, I'm sure that with their isotope analysis, they can do how old some of this nitrogen actually is. Um, I'm sure, but and and aging the water too. But um, it's 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 hard to say. We don't know. We don't have background numbers. But and I, I will say this: the situation is not just unique to Smith Creek. We're seeing it across the ridge over in the um, the Long Meadow watershed. This is one of the watersheds to the west. They actually have phosphorus in the groundwater, which is really unique. Um, but they, they are seeing it in a lot of the other springs in, in the county. Uh, in the area. And it's just, you know, when, when the animal agriculture industry is so intense here, there's been a lot of poultry litter in the area for years. A, a common practice um, when you have limestone bedrock or any bedrock is if it's, if you got a muddy place where you're feeding, if you got a flat rock or an area of rocks, you're going to feed on top of them rocks so you don't have your feed cart or your ring sinking in the mud. Well, we, I can go out in a lot of fields here and limestone rocks are they're cracked or there's what we call solution channels and you can stick your fingers down in holes and those are directly directly correlated a lot of times tied to the groundwater or they're they're feeding in sinkholes or with runoff going into sinkholes and a sinkhole doesn't necessarily have to have an open bottom for for the contamination to be getting down into the to the water it, it, groundwater if it's not I told you a lot of times if the sinkhole is not holding water it's going somewhere <laughs> So good question, Matt. Well, well thank y'all so much. If if um if y'all have more questions, uh, if you think of something later, please feel free to to email uh, Julia or you can or you can email me and uh, I'll be happy to answer. So. Wonderful. Well, Corey, thank you so much for all of that information. That was so much in there, so much great stuff to learn about and what you guys are doing down there. All right. Well, well thank you all. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Corey. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone.